larger point, um, not to get gratuitous on you here, but September 11, 2001, uh, as we all know, this was going on uh, in New York City. Uh, this is the view outside of my window. I live four blocks from ground zero. Excuse me, this is the corner of the building in which I live. I went outside to get this view. I was at the time judging whether I should go collect my daughter, who was in an elementary school two blocks north of the North Tower. North is to the right in this picture. So I wanted to get a closer view with a highly magnified uh, zoom lens to see what, while that was happening, the plane flew into the South Tower. And so no one was thinking terrorism until the second one was hit. The first one was just sort of a bad tragedy. And so these are just three frames from my camcorder. This is at t equals zero. This is one second, well, like actually a fraction of a second. The plane was moving probably 500 miles an hour. And just to understand, the black building, that black sort of monolithic building, that is 50 stories tall. This is New York City, people. So tall buildings are kind of, they're just all over the place. And that's just a hotel, a 50-story hotel. And it's, the, the, the towers are foreshortened because they're the angle at which this is shown. I put these up because a few days after this, President Bush, I don't remember where he said this, on the steps of the White House, in the Rose Garden or at the Capitol, in an attempt to distinguish we from they, the terrorists who flew these planes into the buildings and into the, uh, uh, that went down in Pennsylvania and at the, at, in Washington, to distinguish we from they, he loosely qu quotes a phrase out of the Bible by saying, our God is the God who named the stars. Now, this is before I was on his Rolodex, okay? Uh, because I could have helped him out there. The fact is, of all the stars that have names, two-thirds of them have Arabic names. So this was not, I don't think, his intent with that message. Okay? <laughs> While the constellations are Greek and Roman, the names are Arabic, all right? And the list just goes on and on and on and on. And so where does this come from? How, does, how, do, how do you get us, how does this happen? How do you get stars named with Arabic names? How does this happen? And it happens because, of course, because, hang on, just catching up with myself here. Okay, it happens because there was this particularly fertile period that um, Professor Weinberg duly discussed. Um, and around that period, that 300 year period, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. It was completely open to all visitors, all travelers, Jews, Christians, uh, doubters, which today we might call atheists. They were all there exchanging ideas, all of them. All of them. And it was that period we had the advances in like engineering and, and biology and medicine and, and, and mathematics. All right? Our numerals are called what? Arabic numerals. Now, you ever stop and think about that? You know, who's, who, as in, in America, do we pause, take pause at this? Why are they called Arabic numerals? Okay, they fully exploit the, the discovery of the zero, create a whole field called algebra, itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. All this is going on and it's all traceable, not to some long thousand year tradition in, the, in Islam, it's traceable to this 300 year period. This 300 year period. And then, so they had naming rights. The most expensive, beautifully uh, carved astrolabes come out of this period. There's a great collection of these at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, if you ever want to check them out. So navigation, celestial navigation, all of this is traceable to this period. And so something happened. And what happened, as was previously described, I was told, and I give, forgive me for repeating from what you might have heard, 12th century kicks in, and then you get the influence of this scholar, Al-Ghazali. All right? And so, so out of his work, you get the philosophy that mathematics is the work of the devil. And nothing good can come of that philosophy. That combined with other sort of codification, philosophical codifications of what Islam would, was and would become, the entire intellectual foundation of that enterprise collapsed and it has not recovered since. Over that period, all these books were translated into Arabic on a scale not seen since then. And so, so 
so why, why, why am I even going here? Because I'm trying to explain to you that the, you fast forward, the, the dangers here is that when you fast forward to 21st century America and ask, what influences do we, are we feeling now? Because that, period, that naming period in Islam stopped and, and it never recovered. Because the, 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 the way of thinking about the natural world, revelation replaced investigation. Okay? So I fast forward to 20, 21st century, and what do you find? You get things like this. Okay? This is in America. All right? So now, what I find interesting is, is, the, is the level of passion that it requires to actually do it. You gotta like pay for this, okay? <laughs> and it means a lot of people pissed off at the Big Bang. They're pissed off at the Big Bang. At, at our museum in New York, the American Museum of Natural History, they come to the Big Bang exhibit, and sometimes I don't feel like having that conversation. I say, why don't you go to our hall of human biology first, and then come to us. And that's where we have sort of monkeys holding hands with people in skeleton forms, and then they never make it back to the Big Bang. <laughs> They're gone forever. <laughs> okay. So however egregious the Big Bang is, monkeys and people is a, is, a worse agree, is, a, is a worse transgression, apparently. So there's that, but there's also, uh, here's a little bit of intelligent design here. Here's one that, that is, wants to accept the science, but then is like what's before the Big Bang. We don't quite know yet, so God was there. So, so of course, intelligent design is basically a god of the gaps. But my favorite way to end this then is to just reflect on, uh, I want to do it just a fast tirade on stupid design, and uh, this will be fast. Uh, look at all the things that just want to kill us, okay? Uh, most planet orbits are unstable, uh, star formation is completely inefficient, most places in the universe will kill life instantly, instantly. The people that say, oh, the forces of nature are just right for life. Excuse me, <laughs> just look at the volume of the universe where you can't live. You will die instantly. That is not, that's, not, that's not what I call the Garden of Eden, all right? Uh, uh, galaxy orbits that we orbit once every couple hundred million years, you're bound to come close to a supernova that will wipe out your ozone layer and kill everybody on the surface who doesn't otherwise have dark skin because your high energy rays will give you skin cancer. Um, <laughs> We're on a collision course with the Andromeda Galaxy. Gone is this beautiful spiral that we have. And, of course, we're on a one-way expanding universe as we wind down to oblivion, as the temperature of the universe asymptotically approaches absolute zero. That's the universe. Then Earth, volcanoes, a tsunami just killed, uh, you know, I think that number's higher, it up 200,000 people, floods, tornadoes. None of this is any sign that there's a benevolent anything out there. And this 90% is, should be 99%, as was earlier noted. That's a... Um, of all life that has ever lived is now extinct. Inner solar system is a shooting gallery, comets, uh, uh, asteroids, duck. Um, and look how long it took to make multicellular life. Not from the beginning of the Earth. Life happened quickly, but not multicellular life. Uh, you needed your cyanobacteria to sort of crank on the oxygen, get the oxygen budget going. Then you could have sort of, uh, that's sort of rocket fuel for multicellular creatures. But that took three and a half billion years. That's hardly an efficient plan with us in mind. Um, and in human beings, this is like the most tragic of them. I don't even include here the expression of free will where people want to kill each other. I'm talking about nature killing us without the help of human beings. Aggressive childhood leukemia, hemophilia, all of this, all of this. And we so much praise about the human eye, but anyone who's seen the full breadth of the electromagnetic spectrum will recognize how blind we are. Okay, and part of that blindness means we can't see, we, we can't detect magnetic fields, ionizing radiation, radon. We are like sitting ducks for, for ionizing radiation. Um, we have to eat constantly because we're warm-blooded. Crocodile, you eat a chicken a month, it's fine, okay? So we're always looking for food. These gases at the bottom, you can't smell them, taste them, you breathe them in, you're dead, okay? So, I'm almost done. I'm sorry. I'm taking up your time here. So, so, and with the birth defects, most are unknown. Look at this. <laughs> Others, we, it's like abuse and infection and stuff that human beings have something to do with. Here's, we have no idea. Oops, I pushed a button by accident. Sorry. No idea. No idea. 
And, you know, and birth defects are tragic. They're tragic, particularly if they happen to the family afflicted by it. And you just look at images of these aborted feces because, um, uh, fetuses because of the, and most of these are stillborn. Others are born, you know, born with a heart outside the body. And so this is all simply stupid design. And the problem is, if you look for what is intelligent, and yeah, you can find some things that are just really beautiful, and really, hey, that's a, that's a clever, you know, the ball socket of the shoulder, and a lot of things you can point to, but then you stop looking at all the things that confound that revelation. And so, so if I came upon a frozen waterfall, and it just struck me for all its beauty, I would then turn over the rock and try to find a millipede, okay, or some kind of deadly newt, and then put that in context. And realize, of course, the universe is not here for us, for any uh, uh, singular purpose. My favorite of all is, of course, you eat, breathe, eat, and drink through the same hole in your body, guaranteeing that some percent of us will choke to death every year, okay? Imagine if you had a separate hole for breathing and eating and talking. That would be just really cool, right? <laughs> it was just, you could drink, breathe, and just talk, and you would never choke, all right? And it's not, it's not a hard request. Dolphins breathe and eat through different holes in their body. And that's a mammal. So I'm not asking, I'm not, you know, this is like Santa Claus could bring this one. Um, and this one, of course, my favorite of all, like, what's this going on between our legs, right? As you've heard, like, it's, we have, and, and you've heard it. It's like an entertainment complex in the middle of a sewage system. No engineer would design that at all. Ever. It's like the wrong juxtap juxtaposition of elements. So what I want to put on the table is the fact that I don't want the religious person in the lab telling me that God is responsible for what it is they cannot discover. Because look at the hubris of that. You're in the lab and you say, I don't know how this works. And not only that, no one alive on Earth knows how this works. And not only that, no one who will ever be born will know how this works. That's kind of audacious when you think about it. And then you put it down and go on to the next problem. If this problem is a cure for Alzheimer's or, or cancer or whatever else. I don't want them in the science classroom. And so the issue is simply about progress and discovery. And in my recent forays into Washington, where I've been closer to a community of Republicans than I have ever been in my life, because I grew up in New York City, and in New York City, it's, I think that person is Republican back there. You see? The, <laughs> no, not that one. The one behind that person. Yeah, that's a Republican. <laughs> There's another one. That's in New York. That, so you grow up this way, and I get sort of baptized into a Republican administration. I had two consecutive appointments in the Bush administration, one on aerospace, on the aerospace industry, and one on uh, space exploration, the NASA's future, basically. And I realized something, spending that much time in the community, of powerful Republicans, that Republicans, above all else, do not want to die poor. <laughs> so there's a limit to how far this will go. And I bet most people in this room, even those assembled at this table, were highly concerned about the Dover trial, wondering how that would turn. And I looked at that and I said, I'm not worried, because it's a Republican judge. And in the end, if you put people who are not making discoveries in the science classroom, that is the end of the foundation of your future economy. And so I had a little more confidence than others did because of this uh, uh, sensitivity to the, the money aspect of it. But we all know tomorrow's economies will be founded on, uh, on, on innovations in science and technology, and of course that gets cut short if uh, we lose our civilization, as what happened in Islam in 1100. And the last thought I'll leave you with, which concerns me greatly, if you do the math, okay, you know, just look, you look at all the Nobel Prize winners there ever were, some even in this room, and ask how many were Muslim? And it's like one, maybe two, okay, I, I think a second one was in economics, and the one we referred to was uh, an, uh, described earlier, the co-winner of the Nobel Prize with Professor Weinberg, uh, Abdu Salam. And he's not Middle Eastern Muslim, he's Pakistani Muslim. <clears throat> okay? Now, how many Nobel Prizes are won by Jews? It's like the fourth of the Nobel Prizes. Okay? Some high fraction of the total. And then you look, how many Muslims are there in the world? It's like a billion Muslims. How many Jews? 
15 million tops, okay? So you to ratio these numbers, had Islam not collapsed in its intellectual standing in the year 1100, and you just do the ratios, they would have every single Nobel Prize today. So the fact that it's not only just a few, it's near zero, it is deeply worrying. I'm concerned about what lost, what, 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 what brilliance may have expressed itself and did not in that community over the past thousand years. And so what I want to put on the table is why, so that's, that's the end of my talk, but I want to say, I want to put on the table not why 85% of the National Academy rejects God, I want to know why 15% don't. And that's really the, what we got to address here. Otherwise, the public is, is secondary to this. Thank you for your attention here.